Welcome to Witch Lit, a place to talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. As a special treat for October and to celebrate season three of Witch Lit, I've partnered with my Southern California cousin, Kelly Lane, to tell you about her new creative endeavor, Wiley Women Body Care, from the website. Life is complicated and messy and wonderful. Amazing women whose life stories are traced on their skin stand as our inspiration. Their scars mingle with wrinkles etched deeper for the heartache of loss. And yet they sing, they paint, they write poetry, and they love deeply. I'm Kelly Lane. My story is also complicated and messy and wonderful. I celebrate my ancestors in this collection and formulate for the skincare challenges facing my family and yours. They are hardworking formulas punctuated with grace and beauty. Wiley Women Body Care is committed to helping you achieve and maintain healthier skin. Our goal is to bring you ritual-worthy products made from responsibly sourced natural ingredients packaged in beautiful reusable bottles with stone labels. Give yourself the gift of healthier skin. Our Eva Quill skincare line is produced in small batches from carefully selected ingredients with loving intention. We apply the same standards in our ingredient selection for our formulas as we do in preparing celebratory meals for loved ones and choosing items for our personal altars. Simple, natural, powerful. I've been using Eva Coyle's Crone Oil for the dry skin I've acquired since my move from always humid East Tennessee to the dry Santa Clara Valley in California, along with the fossilized amber anointing balm for centering before meditation and magical work. The scent is ancient, And it also brings up all those early 90 witchy feelings from going to your first like witchy shop. (laughs) Um, Witchlet listeners will receive one milliliter anointing oil blend for Samhain and a one milliliter giant Mexican marigold essential oil for the Day of the Dead with each purchase, along with a 20% discount through October 31st with coupon code WITCHLIT20 at WileyWomen.com. All the details are in the show notes. Brandon Weston is a healer, writer, and folklorist who owns and operates Ozark Healing Traditions, an online collective of articles, lectures, and workshops focusing on the Ozark Mountain region. As a practicing folk healer, his work with clients includes everything from spiritual cleanses to house blessings. He comes from a long line of Ozark Hill folk and works hard to keep traditions that he's collected alive and true for generations to come. He's also the author of Ozark Folk Magic, Plants, Prayers, and Healing, and Ozark Mountain Spellbook, Folk Magic and Healing. Brandon Weston, welcome to Witchlet. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I'm so excited to have you on. I so enjoyed your books. I mean, there is, I'm a, a Appalachian raised girl. So there's a lot of layover and, you know, things in that too. But uh, the first question we ask everybody on the show is, you know, in the age of TikTok and mm-hmm. all of that, why I write? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the reasons for me is, I, I don't know what it is about this like incarnation, but I'm not tech savvy at all. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, writing has always just been the best way for me to be able to sort of express everything that I want to express. It's it's just my sort of like personal medium. I've I've always written stuff ever since I was a kid. I was re- writing like fairy tales and little short stories and stuff like that. So like writing in particular has always been a pretty important part of my personal practice, but then it's also, you know, one of these mediums that I think just appeals to me. Um, I think it works well with sort of the Ozark folk material too. I was actually, I had a class a few weeks ago and somebody asked about the books and you know, what the reaction was to the books in the Ozarks itself. And, you know, for so long, all of this stuff has been passed down orally, you know, through storytelling and things like that. And, you know, in the Ozarks, we're always kind of, you know, 50 to 100 years behind everybody. (laughs) So, you know, for so long, we were passing things down word of mouth, 
But now I feel like we're starting to work into printed <laughs> materials. Mm -hmm. We're starting to work into, you know, healers actually printing pamphlets for themselves and brochures. And so I, I, I foresee, you know, at some point we're going to start moving into computer technology and stuff like that. We're just a little behind. Um, so I think that writing for me has just been sort of the best way I have found to be able to disseminate this, this knowledge, this, mm -hmm. this work. Did you always write like when you were a kid or did that kind of come with wanting to disseminate the information? No, I've, I've always written things ever since I was like a little kid. Um, so writing has always kind of been an important part of my life mm -hmm. work in general. Yeah. So what, um, so you kind of, you studied like folklore and oral tradition stuff. So I assume there was, you know, obviously there's writing with that in academia, but what, how did you go from that kind of writing to like writing for Llewellyn? Like what was the, the journey of that and getting published with Llewellyn? So I actually didn't study any of this stuff academically. Um, I have worked at a university for years now. And so when I was going to college, um, I actually have a bachelor's and master's degree in French. Um, so my, my educational sort of academic area was a little bit different, but that ended up working itself into studying French folk magic, uh, in particular, Cajun Creole folk magic. So it all kind of, you know, worked back into itself. <laughs> yeah. But so when I was in college, I, luckily I had an opportunity to work with folklorists, in particular that folklorists that had worked with people like Vance Randolph, Mary Parler, who are, you know, the most famous Ozark folklorists who wrote back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, the university that I work at actually houses their collections as well and special collections. So I really had just a very good opportunity to be able to work in these folk collections mm -hmm. and sort of just build up my sort of amateur folklorist status, I guess. Mm -hmm. But as I was studying all of this stuff, really what got me into studying the Ozarks in particular was encountering Vance Randolph's works. So Ozark Magic and Folklore uh, was the first book that I read that really sort of clicked with me and made me realize that there is a culture here in the Ozarks and not just a culture, but there are folk practices, there are magical practices, there are healing practices. And so, you know, I grew up in an Ozark family and I had a lot of weird home remedies and stories and things like that, but I didn't really think about that stuff until I encountered folklorists who had actually written about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so once, you know, I had that sort of light bulb moment, um, I really wanted to examine where we are today in the Ozarks. So, you know, most of the folk material published about the Ozarks was published before 1960. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to really update the story. I wanted to do essentially what Vance Randolph and Mary Parler was doing, you know, traveling around collecting stories. But I wanted to collect to really see how these practices have evolved, what has gone away, uh, what has been introduced, what new stuff has come in since, you know, the first part of the 20th century. So I started with the sort of academic side, amateur academic, but academic mm -hmm. side. And originally Ozark Folk Magic, the, the book looked completely different. It was an academic work. Um, it was sort of com compiling my own collection, but comparing it to the folklorist's collection. And so I had every intention to sort of write from that academic perspective. And then about, you know, a quarter of the way into my collecting travels, I met a teacher who ended up being one of my main teachers. And she had a really good way of sort of uh, as we would say in the Ozarks, just sort of slapping me upside the head every now and then, you know, metaphorically. Um, she was really good about sort of cutting through my BS and all of that. Um, and so one, I remember one day we were sitting and we were talking about 
some folk practice or something. And I had my little recorder out and I was taking notes. And she just stopped me in the middle of the conversation. And she said, why are you talking like you aren't a part of this? And I had never thought of myself. I I, I was coming from the academic standpoint, from, you know, the observer. I was on the outside looking in. And I had never thought of myself as being a participant in the stuff that I was collecting. And so from that point on pretty much everything changed i started thinking of myself not as a collector or you know a museum curator but as a living ozarker as a part of this culture as a part of these folk practices Uh, she was the one that identified the gift the healing gift within me so then i started viewing myself as a you know, a practitioner. So it just completely changed everything Mm -hmm. that I was doing. And it also changed what I was writing. So I scrapped the old manuscript and I started what would become Ozark Folk Magic with the intention of being able to voice the stories of healers and magical practitioners that they haven't been able to share Mm -hmm. for 200 years you know the stories have always been about us as healers they have never been from our perspective Mm -hmm. and so that was really the main inspiration for the book was being able to voice not just my own personal journey coming into the practice and evolving with the practice but also being able to sort of voice the stories of the actual practitioners themselves in the ozarks you know, what, what is the truth behind all of the sort of stereotypes and legends and tall tales and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has sort of, that's a, a, a very long winded sort of explanation, but that's really what the evolution, uh, the process was, that's kind of how it went. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely not in the academic world, and I'm very happy for that, actually. <laughs> um, my, you know, pretty early on, I really wanted anything that I published to be accessible mm-hmm. and to be accessible to the people, people like I was when I was a kid. That's been one of the things every time, you know, I get into a rut with writing, I, I, I tell myself, you know, you're writing for who you were as a kid and you're writing mm-hmm. for all of those other people that were interested in this stuff, but then didn't, didn't have access to a university library or, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely write for accessibility. I, I write for a wide audience, so not just Ozarkers, but mm-hmm. everybody. I, I hope everybody can sort of take something from the work. Um, yeah, and that's that's just kind of always been my driving passion as far as this project goes, is to be able to bring the folk magic back to the folk. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. I like that as your as your tagline for your work. Right. <laughs> um, well, it does. I had a question for you, and I think you touched on it, but I'm maybe I will ask it more directly. It seems like from what you said, like maybe you were always interested in the practice, and then there was a study, and then you realized, oh no, no, I am part of this. Because I kind of wondered, did you study the folklore before you really became a practitioner, or were you a practitioner before you studied the folklore? <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of like which came first, the chicken or the egg sort yeah. of situation. So growing up, uh, I mean, I grew up out in the woods. I grew up, you know, constantly around plants. I grew up in a family who really encouraged that sort of interest in me. Um, so even from a young age, I had like herbal books and I'd go out and identify plants and I would make little potions and, you know, I would talk to the fairies in the woods and things like that and i i've always had a long love of folklore of mythology so even as a kid my room was just packed with myth mythology and fairy tale books and stuff like that so i think that there was this really good foundation and it's interesting to look at because it's one of these sort of foundational ozark ideas as well so you know 
with the book, I've gotten to know a lot more Ozarkers and a lot of people have sort of contacted me and said, you know, we used to do this practice in my family too. And what I have found is that everybody, one of the common traits among Ozarkers is everybody grew up with stories. Mm -hmm. They all grew up with weird folk legends, ghost stories. You know, personally, I grew up, my, I, I, my grandpa would warn me about the hoop snake, uh, which is a like magical Ozark creature that it's a snake that can bite its own tail and roll across the ground like a wagon wheel. And it's, it's really fast and it'll chase after you if you're not careful. Um, and so, and just weird creatures and stories about the little people or the Ozark fairies. Um, so that's been one of these sort of common threads that has been connecting Ozarkers for a long time and not just Ozarkers. It goes way back. It seems like, you know, it's in our DNA, almost this storytelling. And so be, me being interested in fairy tales in folk legends and things like that was it was just kind of a common thing in my family. You know, my, my grandpa was always really interested in folk stories and fairy tales and stuff. So I think it's this sort of foundational Ozark connection to be sort of born as a storyteller, sort of. Um, and it's one of those things that I'm trying to sort of revive within people is this idea of telling stories, passing down traditional knowledge as story a part of storytelling um because i think that's kind of faded out unfortunately a little bit so i would say for me the folk the interest in sort of the folklore aspect really came first but it came alongside all of this other stuff because like in my family we would you know there were stories about my great uncle who was a wart charmer who could buy warts off of people there were stories about a great great aunt of mine who read tea leaves and could read people's auras she saw emotions as colors around people and so there's you can't really you know make a firm boundary between what is a sort of personal family story and what is folklore mm -hmm. you know so if you're reading about fairies in a book but your grandpa is also telling you stories about the little people it really blends those lines between you know what is folklore what is mythology and what is just sort of reality mm -hmm. so i think that my interest in sort of the folklore aspect as well as the sort of interest in the practice sort of developed simultaneously yeah. but as a part of sort of a traditional Ozark folk magic, there's always a sort of identification point. Um, so traditionally, you know, there would be people in the community who look, you, you know, would look out for signs or tokens in children specifically that mm -hmm. they might be born with the gift. And this was especially true for traditional healers because healers were constantly looking for people to pass their gift onto because at a certain point you want to retire. Right. <laughs> so you don't want to be doing this forever. <laughs> um, so, you know, traditionally there was this, this identification point and it didn't necessarily mean that you were a healer. It just meant that you had the potential to become a healer more so than other people like you have the potential to become a painter or the potential to become a blacksmith or whatever it might be and you know a lot of that is still a part of the culture today you know more often than not you have practitioners now who just sort of self-identify um some uh, you know i've met healers who have Id been identified through dreams dreaming of ancestors dreaming of spirits there's lots of different w ways today that people do that sort of thing and so for me i think the foundation was there but i didn't really know the foundation was there and then once i had that sort of identification point everything sort of came back to me. So I started remembering the stuff that I did as a kid and, you know, talking to the trees and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it all kind of made sense and began to blend into each other. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it kind of all developed simultaneously, really. No, it's so funny. I think it is, there is so much overlap with Appalachia. And oh, yeah. are, and so, I mean, we know that already. I mean, academically, people know that, but it's just interesting to hear it because I'm like, oh, this sounds so familiar. <laughs> yeah. 
Like, yeah, his cousin, he was a war charmer. Yeah, same kind of, same kind of thing, and all the stories. Although uh, my sister is a fantastic storyteller, and we were kids. She's ten years older than me, so when my little brother and I were little kids, she would you know scare us with family stories and um i never knew what was like our family story like you said or what was folklore because we had like junior who lived in the woods before behind our house and then also like the wampus cat <laughs> stories you know so i was like which one of those is our family and which one is folklore so yeah i i identify with that a lot <laughs> And you, just you mentioning that, I mean, it, it brought up something for me. So that's, you know, that's one of the things that I try to get across in the book. I also, you know, whenever I teach classes, I always tell people that, you know, the the practices that I'm presenting are sort of general practices, but then also personal practices. But you, you have to remember that, you know, all of this stuff developed in families. So mm-hmm. every family kind of has their own connection to the yeah. general stuff, to this general sort of worldview. But then they also have their own mythos. They have their own folk- folklore. If they're yeah. if it's a practitioner family, oftentimes they have their own ways of practicing that are very different from other mm-hmm. places. And so there's so much potential to sort of take this foundational work and then really make it your own and explore it more and find all of those nuances and variations. And, you know, I have collected so much more stuff that I probably will ever actually use because I'm just a magpie in that way. Yeah. <laughs> But even though I've collected so much, there's so much out there that I haven't even encountered yet. And so really, I the book has helped me do this a lot, just kind of building up this network, this Ozark network and get getting Ozarkers to start thinking about this stuff again. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, collecting stories and practices from their own families and sharing them with other people and It's really, uh, for me, it's an exciting time because people are starting to get interested in it again. Yeah, I would imagine publishing the books opened that door because now you're a person people know about that they can reach out to and say, hey, by the way, did you know blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And I get I get a lot of those and I love every one of them. I love stories. I love hearing people's family stories. And I really, you know, one of the things that I really always hit on is collecting stories so mm-hmm. like collect your family stories before it's too late even if it's yeah. mundane stuff you know just yeah. collect everything um but yeah so it doesn't matter where you are it's not an ozark thing everybody has stories and everybody has something to share yeah so. yeah so now that you publish books and obviously this is a big part of your life so how does that interact with your day job which now we know you have a day job but like how much of your life is writing and research and how much is you know all the other things writers have to do to keep food on the table right (laughs) um i i tend to have a pretty good balance just because the way i work is on the outside to some people seems very modern but is actually a very Ozark way of working. The traditional practitioners that I've met all have jobs, you know, Uh, in a lot of cases, healers wouldn't take enough money to actually be able to support themselves. Sometimes they don't take money at all. Um, And so, but this is kind of a foundational belief, I guess, or worldview within the practice itself is this idea that this magical power or the gift or whatever you want to call it, really shouldn't be anything extraordinary it's it's sort of woven into the tapestry of daily life Mm -hmm. so that really everything that you do as a healer or a practitioner can be an act of healing can be a magical act and so one of my teachers one of her practices very powerful practices you know she had clients that she worked for all the time she sort of had a prayer list that she would go through but every one of these people that she was working with when she was washing dishes in the sink, she would put these people on the dishes she was washing. So she would put their name, like she would, you know, visualize their name or their body sometimes even Mm -hmm. on the dishes. And so as she was washing these dishes clean, she was washing clean her patients, her clients. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very, very important sort of fundamental traditional view within Ozark folk magic is that 
none, you know, your tools, your ritual spaces, none of this stuff has to be separate from daily mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And really everything within daily life and the nature and the world in general is sort of imbued with this magic, this power, this energy. And so everything in life can really be used for that mm -hmm. purpose. And so that for me, it, you know, having maintaining that worldview and really having exposure to that really makes having a day job pretty easy because I can actually do healing work at my job too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can do this work at home. I can do it in the bar. I can do it at a restaurant, you know, wherever yeah. it might be. And I think that's a really important sort of worldview foundational idea that I try to get across in the book to this idea that your practice can be as simple or complicated as you want. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about the intention that you put into it, your imagination um, and connecting to that sort of innate magic within yourself and in the world around you. And so, yeah, I definitely, you know, have time that I set aside for writing. I'm on a little bit of a writing break right now. I've got lots of ideas for more stuff, um, but I'm also letting get sort of ferment a little bit <laughs> <laughs> and develop and trying to figure out, you know, what project I actually want to go forward with right now. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm doing lots of classes and interviews and, and things like that with the new book that that's come out and i'm i'm really excited to be able to do that uh that sort of stuff and focus on the spell book and really get get the word out uh, <laughs> about yeah. that well i think and i read them back to back so i apologize if one is in one book and I think it's in the other, but, um, Oh no, it's fine. It all bleeds together. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, really, they are companion books. Yes. I mean, they really are. It's yeah. almost, it's not quite volume one and two, but it is pretty much volume one and yeah. volume two. They were very companion books. Um, but what you said about it being everyday practice, I really thought about, um, and maybe in both books, you said this, that, you know, there is some pushback that somehow this practice should still be like the dancing hillbilly in a cowboy hat. And you're like, no, yeah. no, no, you know, people, this is their everyday life and they use what's in their yeah. everyday life. So, you know, yeah, they are going to wash their dishes and do that, or they're going to use, you know, the cast iron skillet they make dinner with to, to practice, you know, it's not, it's not this, you know, under amber approach to magic. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, folk traditions in general get this Appalachian traditions as well. Mm -hmm. This like this idea that it's you know people looking at a museum display and they forget that these practitioners are living, growing, evolving beings. <laughs> like they're mm -hmm. human beings. They're not they're not exhibits, uh, and so. Yeah, the, <laughs> the I, I, you know, I made this post on Instagram sort of talking about modern magic in the Ozarks because that's been the biggest criticism for the spell book is that people um, have said, which the vast majority of people have loved the spell book and I've been really happy about the feedback. But a lot of the criticism seems to be focused on this idea of the spells are too modern. And what they mean by modern is too new agey or their view of what new agey is. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic to me because all of the spells in the spell book were either taken straight from or modified ritual work from traditional healers. <laughs> uh, so, and it's, it's hard to get across to people that um, with folk traditions in general, you see this a lot that, you know, people, people couldn't afford fancy tools and all of this ritual stuff. And a lot of times, especially today, healers in the Ozarks, you know, are very cunning when it comes to repurposing things. Mm -hmm. And so I've, you know, I mentioned in that, that Instagram post that I have, I have seen miracles worked with, you know, battery powered dollar store candles, you know, or dollar store tea lights. Mm -hmm. And so I think people get sort of, you know, they can't see the forest for the trees, <laughs> yeah. you know, this, you know, they get kind of caught up in a lot of the external stuff and Ozark folk magic is um, not averse to external rituals and things like that, 
but it definitely has this heart of simplicity mm-hmm. that I think is very important as a part of this particular practice. Yeah. This idea that yes, you may work with ritual tools, yes, you may work with you know plants and things like that, but there is a sense of necessity in simplifying those items for the purpose of the practice. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea that you don't want to expend all of your focus and energy in getting the ver- the specific tool that you need. You want to put your focus and energy into the the work itself, into the intention and purpose of the work. And so, you know, there are lots of different sort of esoteric practices that go along with this that I didn't put into the books, but sort of hinted at um, one of the most cunning like repurposes that I've ever encountered in the Ozarks where I, I, I found a few different healers who worked. They didn't have really any external ritual or even objects. They worked a lot with prayer. They worked a lot with verbal charms. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting because whenever they knew herbalism, they knew the power of plants and often used it in medicinal compounds and things. But when they were working with a client, no matter where they were, they would, as a part of their prayers and verbal charms, they would invoke this, the sort of essence or identity of the plants that they needed as a part of the prayer. Mm-hmm. And so they were able to heal people, work on people using the sort of spirits of the plants without even having the plants physically there. Mm-hmm. And so this this is what I'm talking about as far as like the this idea of simplicity as being really the heart of this practice. It's this idea that, you know, as a practitioner, you should really think about how you work and you should be able to work. You know, how, how are you going to work if you lose your hearing, lose your eyesight, lose mobility? You know, how are you going to work if you are in a coma, you know, or in dreams, things like that? And so this, this sort of simplicity often, you know, from the outside, it makes the practices look very simplistic that, oh, it's, you know, the hillbilly is just praying for somebody. But underneath that outward sort of appearance, there's so much, you know, there's so many sort of like complicated metaphysics going on. Um, And that was, you know, writing Ozark folk magic, I really wanted to make that complexity apparent. And so that's why we go into talking about using magical timing, auspicious timing as a part of the work. So making sure that your spell has the best possible chance of being successful and orienting it with the moon signs and the zodiac moon signs and all of this other stuff. All of this stuff has been sort of under, um, under the sort of exterior of simplicity and you know for a long time people have sort of forgotten about that stuff yeah well and i just think about like i guess two two things one is like the things in your everyday life to me are going to have more power energy however you want to think about because you touch them all the time you use them all the time they're part of your extended self and the second being that i think Sometimes because there is, I guess, in pagan, you know, religious, witchy, whatever you want to call it, space, there is this kind of pushback against new age kind of stuff. And I think the thing is, forget that new age kind of borrows from everything. So that if it looks like a new age practice, it's probably because they borrowed it from somewhere. You know, it's not like it wasn't born whole cloth out of someone's right. idea. So, which is true of Ozark practice or Appalachian practice or English yeah. folk cunning, you know, it all, you know, built up over time and drew from different previous traditions. So, yeah, which is an interesting area to look at. I mean, that's why, you know, when people start looking at Ozark folk practice or other folk traditions, they say, oh, that's very similar to this other cultural practice that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's similar because. You know, for thousands of years, human beings have been communicating with each other <laughs> and sharing knowledge and sharing information. Uh, one of the sort of really good experiences that I've had with all of this, I, I was teaching a class and um, I had uh, two participants email me ahead of time uh, because they were really interested in, in the Ozark folk magic and they had bought the books. 
and they were Muslim, specifically North African. And they were really interested because so much of the Ozark stuff was in their folk magic as well oh, wow. and folk healing traditions. Mm -hmm. And so after the class, we just sort of stayed on Zoom and chatted about, you know, oh, Ozarks, we do this and the, oh, we do it that as well. And so that for me is a really interesting area because I've always sort of been interested in folklore and mythology and stuff like that is being able to connect with other practitioners and be able to sort of find common ground. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I always tell people that, you know, this magic, these practices, this isn't an Ozark inheritance. This is a human inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, these practices are a part of our human nature. You know, they're not limited to a specific culture. Every culture has these practices that mm -hmm. pop up. And so if you are looking for a path that is meaningful to you, all you have to do is look to your own cultural heritage and it'll be there yeah. <laughs> magically, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and because Ozark practice is such an amalgam of a lot of different things, it's always fun getting together with, you know, British cunning folk and German folk practitioners and, you know, from all over just being able to sort of compare and contrast practices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you find out is that we are all essentially doing the same things, uh, just in a little bit different ways. A little twink, a little twink, a little, twink a little local color on it. Yeah. yeah. And, you yeah. know, it makes me wonder, you know, of course we don't have a lot, you know, left over from our ancient, ancient ancestors. But it must have been at some point, you know, when human populations were much smaller and much closer together that the practices really were the same and, you know, sort of evolved from there with, you know, moving populations and, and things mm -hmm. like that. And so there is this sort of, I don't know, to, take, to bring it back to an Ozark worldview context, <laughs> the, you know, this idea of sort of as a part of the practice allowing your sort of spirit or mind or imagination or whatever it is to sort of go back to uh, a simpler place within yourself to sort of connect to uh, what I would call this sort of universal magic, this universal connection. Yeah. Um, so I just think about like the opportunity to talk to people, you know, either because they, they approach you because of the book or in classes and stuff like that. And then like having also this academic access through your work. So like, what do you feel like has been like, those all seem like bonuses, but has there been a challenge in that? Like, has there been a challenge in doing the research and, and finding out things you want to know or think? I think the, the most, like the biggest challenge is separating sort of the folk record from where we are today mm -hmm. um, because you know trend has been and I, I i was a part of this too you know you are interested in the ozarks and you inevitably find vance randolph's ozark mm -hmm. magic and folklore because it's still in print um you know he published it for a popular audience and it has been popular for a very long time and so you you pick it up and you start reading this stuff and you mistakenly think that all of this stuff is still around and that colors your idea of the Ozarks today. And the truth of the story is that, you know, Vance Randolph was collecting from informants, uh, you know, who lived through the Civil War. You know, we're talking, you know, very different time period. Ozark Magic and Folklore was published in um, 1947, I think. So it's, it's a very different world that we're living in today. A lot of the practices are still around or, you know, they're still as a, you know, a part of the folklore or the storytelling. So you have people say, oh, well, my grandma was a blood stopper. But do you really find a lot of blood stoppers that are still alive? And unfortunately, no. Mm -hmm. But what you do find is this sort of evolution of this practice amongst practitioners and, and magical healers and all of these other people, you know, they haven't stopped doing the work. <laughs> you know, the work has, has kept going because it's a part of our human inheritance. We need this work as a part of our lives. The work has kept going. It's just people have stopped talking about it. Mm -hmm. 
And also it has evolved. So it's not this museum exhibit. It has, it has incorporated other beliefs. It's incorporated other practices. So in the book, you know, I make a point of sort of separating out the traditionalists from the neo-traditionalists mm -hmm. because we have two different Ozarks that we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, pre-1960s traditional Ozarks, and then we're talking about post-1960s modern, you know, uh, neo-traditionalist Ozarks. And the neo-traditionalists are sort of where my passion area is right now. The folk collections are very interesting to look at, but again, is it applicable today? Not really. Mm -hmm. So, the, But the neo-traditionalists are the practitioners who are still rooted sort of in Ozark traditional stuff. They're still rooted to the land in a lot of cases. They're rooted to sort of these big worldviews, that idea of simplicity, things like that. But then they've incorporated in other practices as well that have come into the area. So, you know, healers who work with both Ozark methods as well as acupuncture or massage or cupping or all of these other sort of folk practices that we think of as being new age that are actually very ancient practices it's right. just you know they were they not familiar with them as, somebody else. yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely so um the neo-traditionalist this is that's where i fall i'm definitely a neo-traditionalist i go back mm -hmm. to my european heritage and draw from that well of practices as well as ozark stuff so mm -hmm. it's sort of this amalgam practice and so the challenge is really when I encounter Ozarkers who are still either stuck in the sort of good old days mentality that you find with a lot of older generations, I'm sad to say, but, or you have younger generations who are getting interested in it again, but they are also viewing it as this museum exhibit. They're, they're mm -hmm. reading Vance Randolph and then they're arguing with me on the internet that I'm not practicing Ozark traditional magic. <laughs> and it, it's like, well, <laughs> you have, you're essentially looking at a, a work that is very good. Uh, it's a very good work of folklore, but Vance Randolph wasn't a practitioner. He wasn't mm -hmm. particularly interested in the Ozarks as a living tradition. He wasn't necessarily interested in Ozark folk magic and healing specifically. The, his most famous book, Ozark Magic and Folklore, was published under the title Ozark Superstitions when it first came out. Mm -hmm. So he definitely had a, a, a view of magic that was highly critical and not very um, ecumenical <laughs> when it came to that. <laughs> yeah. And so it, that, for me, is the challenge, is being mm -hmm. able to sort of balance this position of respecting the the collection the folk collection because that is our heritage that is, that is something that we need to examine but then simultaneously getting people to sort of wake up to 2022 21st century um, especially if you are uh, want to be a magical practitioner or a healer or whatever it might be you have to wake up to <laughs> where we are today and getting people to sort of view or to see that that is in and of itself a traditional way of working. Uh, Ozarkers have always been cunning when it comes to different techniques. They have always used what they had, what they could gather on the land. And as I was told by one of my teachers, if it works, it works. So this has always been an evolving practice. It's just, you know, the people telling stories about healers like to, you know, keep them in a sort of stasis. Yeah. Um, but this evolution, this change is not a quote unquote new agey practice. This is an, this is a traditional way of working. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't always fit with people's uh, sort of image that they want to see mm -hmm. or preconceived notions and all these other things. Well, and I do wonder, like, and I think you say this in the book somewhere about, you know, like, I, and I, I'm, I can't remember the exact phrase, but basically modern medicine has figured out how to treat the body. It's the soul that's sick now. Like, that's what we need to treat. It's like, you know, do you need a blood stopper when there's a clinic on the corner? <laughs> you know, that's probably not the same. You're going to figure out what else is wrong with people <laughs> that, that, that that medicine can't treat. So absolutely yeah and that's kind of one of the areas that this practice has evolved that's like one of those directions that we've evolved in you know practices have died out because 
they aren't needed a lot mm. of times. So do you really need wart charmers anymore? That sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, that's been one of the interesting areas to look at, especially with the neo-traditionalist practitioners. What are the conditions that healers are treating today? Mm -hmm. And of course, there are still traditional herbalists and healers who are addressing, you know, fevers, chills, colds, things like that. Um, and that is a, a very important part of this ever evolving work. But then there are also a lot of healers who are now addressing sort of modern illnesses. Mm -hmm. So we're talking anxiety, depression, um, these sort of illness, mental, spiritual illnesses that at one point in our history would have been, you know, labeled as a curse or a hex or a magical illness, these sort of unexplainable illnesses that manifest in very strange ways. And so we are we are at a time right now where yeah the folk traditions are sort of catching up with modern modern illnesses and ailments which is very exciting to me um because it's it's evolving with the world it's not trying to stay in one specific spot and so yeah i've i've encountered healers and in my own practice even you know um working with people to address the effects of screen time, you know, like, and, and, you know, not being able to sleep because you have too much light, you know, coming from screens and also, you know, working with like, um, gender dysphoria and all of this stuff that in my opinion has always sort of been around within our human cultures, but now we're, we're able to actually identify and label them. And so we're mm -hmm. able to address them in a better way. Yeah. But this is, yeah, this is definitely an area where there's a lot of challenges with people's sort of image of the healer as this, you know, crone in the woods that you go and you visit. Um, the healer can't possibly be the local lawyer um, who heals on the side or the local pastor or, you know, your own grandparent. No, they have to be these sort of, you know, fairy tale images. Uh, and so I find that to be challenging, but then also uh, an exciting area where I can, you know, sort of dispel some of those, those uh, stereotypes. Yeah, that actually, that brings me to a question. So like, what, like, what do you hope readers take from this book? Or what are you feel like your, I guess, duty to them is, or your relationship with your readers? Like, what, what do you hope like this book does out in the world or both books or any new books you other you write do out in the world. Well, it's kind of, uh, I guess it's, it's layered my intention, obviously, you know, one of my intentions is to reawaken these cultural folk practices within Ozarkers. Um, specifically, you know, we have a couple lost generations, you know, I'm, I'm a part of these generations that, you know, we grew up with some weird stories and things like that, but, you know, there was no one around to identify the gift within us or to talk about, you know, the perspective of a healer, or what a healer is, or to even really encourage that as an option. You know, in a lot of cases, you know, that's, oh, those are the old superstitions that we tell stories about, but we don't really believe that stuff's around anymore. And so we have these lost generations that, you know, are sort of looking for a cultural identity. They're looking for a folk practice or a healing practice. And so really, you know, the work is to sort of revive that within Ozarkers. But then, you know, outside of that, I want to, you know, hopefully revive some sort of connection to folk magic, maybe better explain folk magic to people that sort of have uh, very strong opinions about it. Or, you know, if you're a folk practitioner, but you kind of lost your connection to the practice, I hope that some of this stuff can help you sort of reorient to the heart of the practice. Because that's really a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about in, in the first book, and also the second book, is really you know, being able to locate the foundation of this work and also be able to locate the heart of this work. And if you're able to locate those things, you know, no matter what happens on the outside, you know, whatever cultural practices you adhere to, you know, you still have this, this sort of good center, this good framework to, to work from. 
And so, yeah, it's a sort of multi-level uh, um, hope, I guess, here or intention that I've put out. Um, I, I really hope it's a, both of the works and anything I publish appeals to lots of people. Because while I'm an Ozarker writing from an Ozark perspective, I think that um, my own experience with my practice, I think, can fit into a lot of different contexts. Mm -hmm. And I think it can help other, other people in a lot of different paths and contexts sort of reconnect to their own practice and enhance the practice. Yeah. No, I mean, I just from my experience with reading them, and I always feel like reading a spell book like a novel is a, is a little disingenuous. <laughs> like, you know, it's like reading a cookbook, like a novel, which I do right. too, but, um, you know, living with it is a different thing. And, yeah. I, and I hope people will do that too. Cause I think, well, a, you know, like I said, there was a lot of overlap from stuff that I've learned, not just from my own family, but like just Appalachian parks in general, reading books and things, like a lot of overlap there, but um, just new ideas about how to do things. It, like you said, in a very everyday way where I think, you know, in the age of TikTok and Instagram magic, there's this idea that it has to be aesthetically beautiful. And, you know, and that's not always the case. Like you said, sometimes it's washing your dishes, you know, it's mm -hmm. not... It's not always bright and sparkly. So. <laughs> well, and also, you know, one of the things I always encourage in my own students and stuff is like, you know, it's okay to have like the, you know, the Instagram reels of your practices and stuff like that. But, you know, have something that you keep for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, something that you keep for just you. And uh, for me, that will make the, I mean, uh, the, it'll make the practice a lot more meaningful just to kind of keep some things that maybe, maybe you don't always do all your rituals. Maybe there are certain rituals that you don't take photos of, things like that. And just because ultimately, you know, this is your connection to your practice, to your magic, to this magic that's inside of you, to this magic that's in the world. And so, you know, not everything has to be public. Not everything has to be out there. You know, the vast majority of what I do as far as like ritual work and stuff is not public mm -hmm. because I want to keep this sort of heart of my practice and keeping that heart is, you know, maintaining these sort of energies, um, not letting them sort of disperse out into the world. You know, there's a very old traditional belief in the Ozarks that, you know, the more people see or hear your work, the less effective the work is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still kind of, you know, paranoid about what I post and what yeah. I tell and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I always kind of encourage that, especially as, you know, social media, we're, we're more and more getting more and more connected to a wider world. It's mm -hmm. like, keep some things for yourself. Yeah. I, I always think of like the witch's pyramid, like, you know, to be silent is also one of those. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and yeah, I, I am not comfortable sharing, like, I don't really share my practice on social media. And I do wonder, like, you know, cause my theory too, is like, not, maybe it's, you're, it's not taking away from your power, but like, if you're actively publicly working on things, who's to say someone's not working against you then? Yeah. And I mean, you know, you know, like Ozarks, it just, you know, like uh, another foundational sort of traditional belief in Ozark folk magic is that if somebody is able to see the ritual you're doing, they can reverse it mm -hmm. by, you know, so if you take a photo of your work or a video of your work, they can collect all of those materials and reverse whatever you're doing. Yeah. So I, I'm also sort of, you know, I realize that people practice in different ways. So I don't, I don't, I never say that this is the exact, this is the truth. This right. is, you know, yeah. if you post a photo of your work, somebody will reverse it because that's not the case. And even in an Ozark context, you know, I've met healers who were, you know, who believed in curses and believed in, you know, their enemies were cursing them. And, uh, you know, if their enemies were able to see into their house, they could reverse all the work. And then I've also met healers who was like, no, I'm protected. You know, I could, they could do whatever they wanted to do because they had that firm confidence in the protection yes. of their work. And so there's, a, you know, every every person has their own unique way mm -hmm. of practicing. So I never like to begrudge people. But I will say from a personal perspective, allowing yourself to have some things that are just for you, just for private, 
I yeah. think is mentally and spiritually healing mm -hmm. um, to be able to sort of keep that for yourself, to keep something special, something unique, something that is, you know, close to your heart within the practice that, you know, you don't tell anybody uh, yeah. unless you want to pass it down or something like that. Yeah. No, that makes sense to me. And, and, kind of, and it's kind of in line with my personal philosophy. Like I don't begrudge, like you said, people who do it. I enjoy looking at those pictures on Instagram. Uh, yeah, same. <laughs> so, um, I'm not going to work against them because who has time for that? But um, right. <laughs> yeah, like I, but yeah, like I, I just personally, I, I don't feel comfortable sharing stuff, but, um, but for the things that you do share, before we get to our last question, which is our little game of chance, um, where can people find you for the things that you do publicly? Absolutely. Um, so I have the two books that are available for purchase across the internet, as well as from the publisher Llewellyn um, on their website, and also select in-person stores, I am sure, because it seems like everybody, every now and then somebody will message me, I saw your book at this uh, bookstore and so i don't know where they are in person um but i do know they're across the internet i also have a website ozarkhealing.com and um, i do virtual classes i do in-person classes here where i'm located and so announcements about all of those classes will go up on the website uh, i also offer a backlog of most of my virtual classes um, the recordings are for sale on the website uh, and it is a wide variety of topics, everything from Ozark astrological magic to plant magic to repurposing household items, lots of different stuff. Um, I also have a Facebook page for Ozark Healing Traditions. It's just Ozark Healing Traditions. I have a Instagram at Ozark Healing Traditions. Yes, at Ozark Healing Traditions. Uh, and then a Twitter at Ozark Healing. And I, so I pretty much post across all my social media, um, especially announcements for classes and stuff like yeah. that. So. Great. And I will have links for all of that in the show notes. And then for our final question, um, is a tiny game of chance. Am I going to die? And um, partly this is like, I, I always joke, I have a Scorpio like through and through. And I, small talk doesn't interest me. I always like to talk about stuff we're not supposed to talk about, which is probably why I started a podcast. <laughs> so, but I'm going to roll the die. And depending on what I get, you will get a question related to your work in some way. I try not to just like left field people um, about death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And if I roll a Love six, it. you'll get to pick which one you want. So, and I think my cat just jumped off the chair there. <laughs> So for politics, it's always an interesting one. Um, so do you think that witches, magical practitioners, I guess it, healers even, do they have political obligations? And if they do, what are they? You know, I tend to be pretty egalitarian when it comes to stuff like this. I, I feel like, yes, absolutely. If you are a magical practitioner or a healer, you can have... Um, you know, a political connection. I mean, it's historically a part of our traditional magic is, you know, cursing the local sheriff that you don't like <laughs> and, you know, things like that yeah. is definitely a part of our traditional work. Um, I think amongst healer culture, what you find in the Ozarks, and this is kind of goes into my own personal philosophy, um, healer culture is much more likely to uh, heal anybody that comes to the door. That's a very important sort of foundational idea that um, as a part of the sort of terms and conditions of your gift, uh, you know, there is this idea that you are healing anybody who is in need. And so anybody that comes to the door, you should be ready to do work for them. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do everything that people say um, because a part a traditional view of healing work in the ozarks includes not just healing ailments but also healing conditions so if your marriage is going south you know healing a marriage healing somebody's bad luck 
things like that. So healers and practitioners get a lot of, you know, diverse people at their door. So it's not to say that, you know, if somebody comes to your door and says, you know, I want you to make this person fall in love with me, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to say yes to that. Mm -hmm. But in my own personal practice, I've had lots of these sorts of very dubious uh, questions and requests. And I feel like, you know, okay, I'm going to offer some work for this person. It's not going to be what they ask because that goes against a lot of my personal ethics, but it's going to be something. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, you know, if somebody comes asking for me to do something, you know, curse a person, well, maybe I don't curse that person because based on the story, you know, it doesn't seem like they need to be cursed necessarily, but maybe I will do some work to help heal whatever is going on in this situation you know whatever whatever has driven you to this point where you want a curse to actually physically harm or kill a person maybe let's you know do a ritual to help you re-examine that within yourself you know (laughs) and so for me this is sort of a foundational view of the work is this idea that you know anybody that comes to the door, you you are going to do some work for them. I guess it's connected to this idea of hospitality as well. You know, anybody that comes to the door, you'll give them some sweet tea and a snack. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter who it is. And so I kind of connect that also to my work with, you know, politics and things like that um, is this idea that, you know, I can have my sort of political opinions and even work that aims towards sort of political ends. But at the end of the day, no matter who comes to my door, I am going to offer some sort of help. That makes sense to me. I mean, I think it's, I mean, not maybe as codified as like a Hippocratic oath. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and I think about like stories about, um, <sighs> I, want to, I, I don't want to invoke like horrible things that happened in our culture, but like after a shooting that involved mm-hmm. like, you know, specifically targeting a certain, certain religious group, then the mm-hmm. nurse who had to treat that person who'd been injured by the police responding was of that religious group and then had to treat this person who had just murdered people like her. You know, yeah. I, I think um, like we don't think about healers having to in- to deal with that on such a political mm-hmm. level. Um, but yeah, it's there. Well, especially in this region. So, I mean, where I am, it, it is a strange mixture of both blue and red, <laughs> you know, yeah. with kind of an overwhelming amount of the red. Um, you know, there are still lots of traditionalists who work within a Protestant Christian worldview. Um, and you know, it's interesting, even amongst those healers that I've met, they still have this view of, it doesn't matter who comes to the door. Even if I don't agree with them on a personal level, I'm still going to heal them. I'm still going to work for them, that sort of thing. And so I kind of try to keep that sort of egalitarian view, but it it is, it is difficult in this area because you, we are constantly faced with these sort of big political arguments and debates. And so I, you know, locally, I have definitely encouraged witch covens and groups with, you know, rituals that I know targeting courts and law and medical processes and all sorts of stuff. So I I feel very strong in providing that sort of information for people because I think that magical practitioners and healers have, as far as my culture goes, have always had their hands in stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think it is an extension of my sort of the work of my ancestors, both, you know, blood ancestors and spiritual ancestors to Mm -hmm. provide that information, um, to those who need it. And of course, in the spell book, I have at least one spell that is a spell specifically for targeting the law. So working against, um, those law and court influences. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, with the you know, we're recording in July. I think this is going to come out in October. So who knows what will happen between now and then. But like with the recent stuff around the Supreme Court and Roe v. Wade, like I think, you know, these conversations that are happening publicly on Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that about, you know, 
traditional ways of achieving goals that are now no longer legal where you live Mm -hmm. and people like being, but wait, (laughs) you know, like that might've worked, but they were also like willing to do something that risky with some of these Mm -hmm. herbal treatments and stuff, because the outcome at that point was so bad. It's like, we have other ways to do this that are safer now. This is not, you know, 1950. Let's talk about what this looks like. So, you know, I think that that infusion kind of like you said, of like these traditional healer ways, plus how things have evolved is really important in these current conversations. Like, I just don't want people to like, you know, blow out their liver with pennyroyal when maybe we can just get them, you know, modern medicine to do the same thing. So we'll get them, get them a ride to uh, mm-hmm. a location that they need to go to that right. sort of thing. Yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of hoarding knowledge. <laughs> so, you know, be informed if you are interested in these herbal processes and alternative ways of dealing with some of this stuff, collect it, memorize it, you know, have books on hand for when we perhaps are in a worse place so that we can keep the knowledge going. You don't necessarily have to use it right now in order to, you know, keep it with you. Um, But yeah, I think that is an important part of the the work that I do is sort of keeping people grounded within uh, a little bit more modern view of what's, you know, of the world and what's going on. And that's also kind of a challenge sometimes when there are lots of people I've encountered in the Ozarks still using, well, we talked about plants like Pennyroyal, but still using just plants for different medicines in general Mm -hmm. that are just poisons. They're just Mm -hmm. like, they're just killing your body. So yeah, that's, that's, I think that's a challenge with folk traditions in general is what do we need to keep from the past and what do we need to get rid of Mm -hmm. to kind of be in a safer, more effective place today? Yeah, I learned something really important from your book that I did not know that American mistletoe and European mistletoe were different. I yeah, didn't know that they different were different species. species. I just always knew it's very poisonous. Don't mess with it. But I didn't realize that they were different. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how many times have people made that mistake of thinking this thing is this thing because of tradition mm-hmm. without, yeah. you know, some science behind it or some knowledge of yeah, the botany it, it, behind and- it? <sighs> It's even more dangerous because European mistletoe, the toxicity is relatively low. It's still toxic, but Mm -hmm. I mean, you see old herbal manuals written in from Britain from like a European context that they have mistletoe in remedies um, Mm -hmm. because mistletoe was traditionally used in lots of remedies. But you cannot translate that to American mistletoe, as Uh far as I know. Um, So American mistletoe, the toxicity is much higher. Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, it's dangerous because you have people reading these old manuals or, you know, herbal books, and then they go try to find their local varieties of whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. and then they end up poisoning themselves. We have done some research since Nicholas Culpepper. Like, (laughs) just don't let that be your only book. Right. Yeah. They, it can, he is very good with some things, uh, many other things he is not. Well, so one of my favorite herbals is um, Miss Greaves, Mrs. Greaves, uh, the modern herbal. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's still today one of the best herbals. Um, I still use it for a lot of stuff, but I believe she has mistletoe, European mistletoe, as a, as a remedy in that book. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. So there you go. Politics and practicality all in one go. (laughs) Brendan, thank you so much for being on the show. This was a lovely conversation. Thank you for having me. um, I'm looking forward, like I said, to living with your books and, you know, spending some time in there. Um, But yeah, hopefully next book, we'll get you back on. We'll talk some more. Be great. Awesome. Yes, I would love to come back. I could talk all day about this stuff. (laughs) That's the best part about having a podcast. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Thanks. Witch Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press and is edited by Kaifel Agostini. Our music is Voices by Alexander Shinekar. You can support our work at ko-fi.com slash witchlitpodcast. And if you'd like to submit your own death 
sex, religion, politics, or money questions, or have questions or comments about the show, you can send an email to victoria at witchlitpod.com. And please be sure to let us know if we can use your name on the show. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at witchlitpod. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and consider giving us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps other witches find the show. Thanks for listening and for reading Witchy.